As a deer hunter, I want to know all I can about America's favorite big game animal. That's why I became a deer farmer. Without deer farms, we lose our greatest resource for research and whitetail management. With them, we gain more knowledge than ever before. Join me as we discover the truth about whitetails and meet those who work every day to preserve this great species for future generations. My name is Keith Warren and this is Deer and Wildlife Stories. If anybody spent much time on a deer farm, odds are they love white-tailed deer as much as a deer farmer. Hi everybody, I'm Keith Warren and welcome to the show. Uh, you know, one of the most common questions that deer farmers receive is where do deer ultimately wind up that are raised on a deer farm? Well, on today's program, we're gonna answer that question and we're gonna show you a lot of big deer right here in Northern Ohio. Hey baby. I'm Ben Ferguson with LA Whitetails, located in Nashville, Ohio. We've been raising deer for six years, and we have 250 deer on the farm. I started deer farming because I love animals. I love whitetail deer, and I wanted to start a farm. And uh, per acre, this was the best uh, option we had to start a farm on a relatively small tract of land. Deer farming has been really rewarding to me and my family because we've been able to do it together. My brother runs the day-to-day -day operation, and my children uh, are able to come out with me in the evening and check on the new fawns, check as the bucks grow, and uh, check the overall health of the deer. I think my children have uh, most of the deer named by now, uh, although the names change day to day. But this is a, a, a farm activity for the whole family. We're in north central Ohio, and this is beautiful whitetail country, and I just love the weather up here this time of year. It seems like the deer in Ohio I mean, every place I go, I, I see some big deer, but for whatever reason, the deer in Ohio, I don't know if it's the weather or just the geographic location, but my gosh, there's some big deer in Ohio. My children uh, love to help out on the farm. Uh, Lowen and Layla love uh, to come back and uh, watch the deer. They learn a lot about uh, nature. They learn a lot about uh, animals in general. And I think that overall, growing up on a farm gives them great work ethic, great values, and uh, overall uh, compassion for animals. I don't know of a better place in the world to raise a kid than on a farm, and specifically on a whitetail farm. You know, at this point, I mean, Ben's youngest son, Lowen, I mean, he's been around since he was a little bitty guy coming up and feeding the deer. And I've known Lowen since he was a little bitty guy. And it's interesting to watch him interact, but now he's got a little sister. And although she may be too young to actually start helping and working, she's not too young to be interested. And so I don't know of a better place to raise a kid than on a deer farm. We're the Fergusons. We're the Fergusons. <laughs> and you're and watching, watching Deer and Wildlife, Wildlife Stories. Stories. And we'll be right back. And we'll be right back. Deer and Wildlife Stories is brought to you by the North American Deer Farmers Association, New Dart, the North American Deer Registry, Bean Fence Company, WinADeerFarm.com, the Texas Deer Association, Newport Laboratories, Game Management Systems, Shock Effect Maximizer and Seacal. Deer Guardian Misting Systems, BuyMyDeer.com, Dr. Ray Favero's Whitetail Genetics, Record Rack Deer Feeds, and by All Seasons Feeders. It's a lifestyle. Today's program is brought to you by the Texas Deer Association. When you come out here to LA Whitetails, the one thing that you're going to notice if you're a deer farmer is instantly you're going to notice that these deer are really, really calm. And I want to address that. You know, the, the way that deer stay calm is they stay calm 
by being treated right from the very uh, uh, first moment they hit the deck when they're born. And so you'll notice in the doe pens, you're going to see these little wooden teepees, we call them, these little shade shelters. Uh, and what happens is the fawns will lay up underneath here. It kind of gives them a, a nice little secluded place to, to get out of the sun, maybe to get away from the rest of the deer and uh, just to, to have a little peaceful place of their own. But uh, like I said, it's peaceful. And what these deer, the deer on a deer farm, you want them to have a peaceful life. The, uh, the more gentle a deer is, then the better food and water you can get into them, the, the better the deer are gonna be overall. And so it starts out when they're babies like this, and uh, you'll notice the does uh, sometimes will get up underneath here, but the babies love these little wooden teepees. Now these deer, they've got some age on them. How old are they? These are all, this is the three-year-old pen. We have uh, one in here, it's one of our original sires, and uh, other than that, they're all three years old. Is that, uh, and I know as I look through the farm, you've got different color tags on them. I notice that the bucks in here are all black tagged. Is that, is that to indicate they're all three year old? Right, uh, yeah, every year we change the tag color. It helps us identify them quickly. And uh, we also try to sort them by pen mm -hmm. uh, throughout the year. The only time we split that up really is uh, for breeding. Okay, well, but we had been talking off camera about about y'all have really a different breeding strategy. You kind of went back to the old way of breeding. So explain that. Well, you know, what we do is we try to quickly establish our genetics. And, you know, there's a lot of people in the market, quite frankly, uh, we were guilty of it, is we were going out and buying different genetics from all over the, the nation. And we really didn't uh, streamline that and find what produced consistently on our farm. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody has their way of breeding. What we have done is we found a couple, what I'll call main lines of genetics. And what we've done is we've line bred those in and then bounced them out uh, with an outcross and really developed what I'll call is our line of genetics. And it's, it's, you can see it's, it's proven to be very successful for us. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that one thing in, the, in our industry, it's a, in, the, in the deer farming industry, as you know, it's almost like the flavor of the month type deal, right. okay? I mean, there's so many big deer out there, right. and, and when you get so many deer out there with good genetics, somebody's gonna pop and get big. But the key is, you don't really know if those big deer, at, at, when they are yearlings or two-year-olds, are even gonna produce. Well, you know, that's the thing is, you know, you start doing that, and uh, again, we've done that, and I think that there's certainly a, a, a part of that that should be in everybody's breeding program, and I think that should be an outcross as opposed to doing that every year. I think what you should do is find your genetics that consistently produce for you on your farm. Mm -hmm. And what we like to do is we breed those tight, and then we use uh, genetics from other people's farm as our outcross, and then breed okay. them back tight again. Well, it also saves you on, on semen purchasing, too. Oh, it, without a doubt. So, I mean, without a doubt. That's why we have these big breeders and these sires on our farm. Okay, but I've heard y'all have a deer over here. Which one is uh, a buck named Production? Production, huh? Yeah, he, he's incredible. We really like him a lot. He's up here on the hill. Yeah. And uh, if you take a look and you see, you know, what, what he's done, he is a, what I'll call a fast starter. Mm -hmm. And when I say fast starter, I don't mean each season. I mean as a yearling. If you take a look, and, and we'll see as we go through today, uh, our yearlings aren't nearly as uh, fast as starters as what I've seen in other people's business. Mm -hmm. But we're not moving these deer as yearlings. We're not promoting these deer as yearlings. What we're doing is we're promoting them in two and three and four and five years old. Mm -hmm. And what we're more interested in is the genetics as opposed to how they look as a yearling. Okay. And, and so production, production, he came on early though? He came on early. He came on strong as a yearling and uh, Delvey and I decided this is one that we're going to breed with. We liked his pedigree a lot. That's why we called him production. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's a Rolex kingpin son. And, you know, you take a look at what those two sires have done for the industry in general. And, you know, we felt that there's almost no way he's not going to produce and produce for years. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing it. We're, yeah. we're seeing it. We like him a lot. So who's this other guy over here? That's uh, nice. Yeah, he, he's incredible. He, I, I think he's one of the prettiest, biggest bucks on our farm. And that's Waldo. And that's a direct uh, son from one of our original sires, which was Bulldog. Mm, okay. Wow. Well, this is beautiful. Well, you've got a buck named Rush. Where is he? He's over in another pen here. He's incredible. We, we, we love this buck. Today's show is brought to you in part by 
buymydeer.com, your online source for monster whitetails. Closed captioning for Deer and Wildlife Stories with Keith Warren is brought to you by Keith Warren's Texas Hidden Springs Ranch. All right, Dale from Texas writes, my deer hunting property is under game fence, but I only have a few nice deer. What's the easiest way to change this? Dale, the easiest way to change it is simple. Contact a deer farmer and bring in some new genetics, some good quality genetics, and virtually any deer farmer is gonna have better genetics than what you've got on the property right now, I guarantee it. If you're in Texas, contact the Texas Deer Association. They can put you in touch with a deer farmer close to you. And Dale, thanks for the email. All right, part of taking good care of your animals and uh, practicing good animal husbandry is to make sure that they're, uh, they're fed properly and they're watered properly. As far as feed, uh, in every one of the, the pens, you're gonna notice a, a uh, shed like this, a little feed bunk. And then they've got a mixture of feed here. This is a textured feed. It's, a, it's got a mixture of uh, record rack pellets in it, and it's got some corn, some soybeans, some oats but in, uh, they put some soybean oil in here with it. Uh, what this does, uh, it allows the deer to come anytime they want and to be able to eat from here and they can monitor how much the deer are eating per day. If, uh, and what they'll find out a lot of times is that a lot of times these animals will come in, they'll consume more uh, at, you know, one time a year versus the other time a year depending upon what their nutritional needs are, whether they're growing antlers or whether does are lactating or whatever. But in addition to having feed out like that, one thing that they've done differently here, now this is Ohio and it gets doggone cold up here. This is an electric water. Uh, years ago, they were watering by hand up here and I mean that's a chore when it gets down below freezing up here but the deer have to have good water, good clean water, and we need to do everything we can to encourage them to drink as much water as possible. So what this is, they ran an underground water, underground electric, and this is, like I said, it's a electric water. So there's always good, fresh, clean water, uh, even in the dead of winter. And the one thing that we have found with raising big white-tailed deer is the more water that you can get into them, the better they are. All right, so this is just a pen of yearlings then? Yeah, well, yeah, we got we got the yearlings. Hold and, on, uh, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> I know who that yeah. is. That's got to be Rush. That's right. Yeah, he is. Uh, he, he's the biggest by far uh, buck on our farm, and uh, he has really done a lot for us as far as the production side. And you know, most of the yearlings in here are out of Rush. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, it goes back to talking about the production, and you know what he's been able to do with his genetics. He's a uh, shadow bucky Herbie. And those genetics, Shadow, Bucky, and Herbie, mm -hmm. that is such production. And uh, that's what, again, that, uh, we're gonna talk about it a lot. That is what we do here on our farm. We mm -hmm. really focus on consistent production. Well, you know, I, I look at your pens and I think the, the, these deer, they're, they're all gentle. Right. All of them, and that, that's a sign of uh, good animal husbandry. Right. Okay, it's a sign of spending a lot of time around the animals. I mean, the more time you spend around the animals, the, the, the more they're gonna use, get used to seeing you and you them. Right. And you can also uh, pick up whether, whether they're not feeling well or not. Right. Right. Okay. And when they're not feeling well, boy, you can pick it up like that, like one of your kids. If right. your kid isn't exactly. feeling good, you know your kid's not feeling good. So as a deer farmer, we wind up, we're looking at these guys and I haven't seen a deer that doesn't feel good here. These, well, these guys are all healthy. They all have their unique personalities, believe it or not. I know mm -hmm. you know that. Yep. And uh, my brother is in these pens, sometimes, no kidding, 16, 17 hours a day. Mm -hmm. So he's able to pick up immediately when somebody's not feeling well, when somebody's stressed up, somebody's pacing, somebody's laying when they should be up, they should be at the feeder. And uh, he's able to get on it quick and treat them. And again, I'd love to take the credit for uh, what you see here as far as the calmness and the uh, overall health of the animals, the quality of our pens. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, my brother's the one who does that. And uh, he's been wonderful for me and wonderful for the farm. And you, you take a look, you can see you know, what it's able to do for us. All right, well, you've shown me the three-year-olds and now one-year-olds and Rush. Take me to your two-year-old pen. All right, let's go. I just think deer are absolutely wonderful, and if you've ever spent time on a deer farm, odds are you're going to love white-tailed deer as much as a deer farmer does. Now, if you've been watching our show, you've probably seen win a deer farm contest going on. Well, if you'd like to win a deer farm, that's right, we're setting somebody up with a deer farm absolutely free. All you need to do to register is go to winadeerfarm.com. Again, winadeerfarm.com, it's absolutely free. Now it's time for the Beam Fence Minute. 
As a landowner, one of the things that a lot of guys have problems with is having a fence that's properly spliced together. I'm Mark Beam from Beam Fence Company. Let me show you how we splice wire together. Over the years, we've tried different ways of splicing wire together. We found out that the Nyko press crimp works the best for us. It's a little bit it's stronger and it's also longer, so you only have to crimp down once versus the smaller crimps where you have to add more and more together. With this type of crimping system, one crimp does it all. People want to have a fence that's going to last a long time. This is one of the tools that we use to make sure that that happens. If you'd like to find out more about constructing a fence, go to our website at beamfence.com. Everybody in here's got a purple tag, it looks like. So how old are they? These are, this is our two-year-old pen. Okay, well, I mean, I, they're all they're all two-year-olds. Wait, wait, wait a minute. What's there's a black tag right. one down there. What's that one? The black tag. He's a three-year-old. We put him in this pen a year ago. He actually broke his leg, and we put him here with the younger bucks, kind of to nurse him back to health. Mm -hmm. You can mm -hmm. see he's he, he's he's back to health. He's doing oh, yeah. really really well. But he's he's in this pen again. Goes back to he's comfortable. He's calm. Uh, there's no reason for us to make the change. So we left him in here. And so you wound up you put him in with all these two-year-olds right. because. Clearly, uh, it, it, he was a year older. Right. Okay, so right. a little bit more dominant. But right. because he was cut back with a with a leg injury, right. Right. you put him in there. So hopefully nobody's going to beat him up. And clearly, I mean, he's he's rehabbed fine. Right. You know the story. If he's in the uh, in with his peer group, I'll call it, and uh, gonna he's injured, they're they're going to be hard on him. Yeah. Well, so. that's that's same with any animals. I right. mean, yeah. So that's cool. Okay, but but wait a minute. There's a big yellow tag buck over there. What's the deal right. with him? Right. Oh, well, that's Bucky's impact. He's been a good breeder on our farm as well. Uh, he had a uh, full brother named Aces Up, and the two of them have done a lot for us in, in the industry in general, but uh, they've done a lot for us on the farm. You'll see a lot of production out of these two bucks. Uh, we lost Aces Up. Uh, uh, he died probably two years ago. Bucky's Impact, he's five. Uh, we like him a lot. We continue to breed him, and uh, he's part of our long-term genetic plan. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a big old deer, but I'm assuming with the name Bucky's Impact, he comes straight from the fleece line. That's right. Yep, he's, he's uh, pure fleece. And uh, they have an outcross in there, but it's uh, it's basically pure fleece. And we'll talk about, and we have been talking about how we started our genetics and uh, came to what I'll call our line. And really, what it is is we uh, went with heavily fleece does, and we went with a lot of the Wad Vogel bucks, and we've continued to cross those two lines. And you can see they've been very, uh, you know, very good for us. Yeah. Well, okay. So these deer right here, do you do you sell? Okay, I'm just wondering if I was a viewer sitting at home and go, what kind of deer do you sell? Do you right. sell uh, just three-year-olds? Do you sell just bucks? Do you sell does? Do you sell just, I mean, what do you, what do you sell? Anything from yeah. a fawn up? Well, we sold a fawn this morning. Okay. So, uh, we, we sell fawns. We sell uh, bucks of all ages. We, you know, we have a lot of people that come to our farm as a farm tour. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they come to the farm, what they're looking at is number one, uh, any tips they can get on animal husbandry, how we you know, raise these deer, how do we keep them calm, mm -hmm. how do we keep them uh, healthy. And what they're also looking for is uh, new genetics. Mm -hmm. And deer they like, they like the look of them, then they like the, uh, the, you know, how the genetics are lined up throughout the pedigree. And you know, depending on what they're after, we could sell them a couple yearling bucks, we could sell them a, a mature bred doe, we could sell them one of our mature breeders. There's a lot of different things that uh, a lot of packages will put together, and a lot of different uh, um, a lot of different deer people would buy for different reasons. And the good thing about dealing with somebody like Ben, he's in Ohio, and Ohio is one of the most deer friendly, deer farming friendly states there right. is, as far as uh, regulations go. The borders are open. We can transfer deer from Ohio to other states that have borders open. Right. So if you're in an open border state. Uh, we can certainly, you know, deal with you. I mean, right. Ben will be happy to, I mean, put them on a trailer and send Delvey down with them That's and right. drop them off. Right. But one thing I like about these guys, you can see a lot of nice typical frames. Right. I mean, they're just, just pretty. They, they look like right. deer are supposed to look, right. in my opinion. Right. And that's what I like. We like certain looks. Um, our breeders and our major sires, they'll, uh, you know, that's the real big deer. We like them, they're blood pushers. Mm -hmm. They really help our, our genetics mature quickly. Um, but if you take a look at our two-year-olds and our three-year-olds, you know, there's some what I'll call clean-looking typical deer, and that's the look we like. But uh, again, you know, we intentionally have a variety of different looks here. If y'all have got any questions or comments about today's show, 
please get a hold of me. You can get a hold of me and post those questions on my Facebook page or shoot me an email. Uh, make sure and contact me. I'm Keith Warren. I'd like to thank you for watching Deer and Wildlife Stories. What you're about to see is graphic in nature, so viewer discretion is advised. Last August, many of Texas's deer farmers were forced to kill hundreds of perfectly healthy deer in order to test them for chronic wasting disease. To date, approximately 600 deer have been killed, and the killing isn't over. What's worse is that out of all the deer that were killed, not a single one of them tested positive for chronic wasting disease. I don't know about you, but to me there's just something wrong with the picture when you start killing perfectly healthy deer to test them to make sure they're not sick with chronic wasting disease. Now CWD has been around for over 50 years and I'm a believer that CWD, it needs to be managed uh, from science-based management rather than from a political agenda. And I think that we ought to learn from states that have been battling CWD for more than 50 years. And they themselves say that uh, there's nothing they can do to manage it. What they need to do is just monitor it. So again, I think that we ought to base our CWD stuff all on science and not on a political agenda. If you'd like to find out more about chronic wasting disease, let me encourage you to go to the website, cwdmyths.com.